Hi, I'm Brian. Welcome to Autogra Fool. 2017 is when the Stelvio burst onto the scenes for Alfa Romeo. And at the time, a lot of people were a little bit skeptical to say the least. Why? Well, Alfa Romeo are really known for very distinctive driver's cars. And this, their first ever SUV, certainly ruffled a lot of feathers. Well, two years seems like a very appropriate time for us to take another look especially because Alfa Romeo have just unleashed a brand new lineup of trim lines. Well, I think the first thing to make absolutely clear is that this is not a brand new car. So if you already own a Stelvio and you're looking to answer the question, is it time for an upgrade? Well, it might be, but probably not only for the reasons presented here by this car today. But if you don't have one and you've always been quite tempted, these fresh lineups might well be a reason for you to take a closer look. The styling on this car, for me, has always been something that Alpha got really spot on. It's very hard to take a much loved concept, and I think the Julia is very well loved throughout the driving community, and then expand that, make it larger, but keep the styling that made it so popular in an SUV format. As you can see from the face here, there's an awful lot of the Julia DNA that's made it through into the design here. What's new with the trim line is that instead of those chrome accents that we're used to seeing on the face of the Stelvia, we now have this piano black, and it certainly does help to make the front of this car look just that bit more aggressive. Now, the headlights are still just by Xenon. They are not full LED in the front. Personally, I don't think that makes a huge difference, and it does give us a very classic looking appearance to the nose on this car. It leads you really nicely through up to the bonnet and gives you a nice clue as to what's to come once you get around to the side. Four meters 69 or 185 inches is the length of this car. And I think the proportions are really nicely worked out. So again, you can see a lot of the Julia's characteristic, but the side of the SUV is often very challenging from a design standpoint. You really want to make sure that all of the features that are loved about the smaller model are carried through, but it is going to be a larger proposition. The way that they've broken up those visual lines are with these lines in the body. They really do strike quite opposing visual levels. And when you take in the roof line as well, and a nice high shoulder line, what you get is quite a large car that in actual fact visually has been made to look quite compact. And that's important. This car has to look sporty. So one of the updates for the new trim lines that I'm quite a big fan of is this. We have brand new black wheels. Again, as with the black at the front, it makes the overall aesthetic much more aggressive, much more sporty. And again, it helps visually to diminish that mass of metal just a little bit more. If the side of an SUV is a challenge, this at the rear of the car is where the designers start to cry. Why? Well, you have to really mix practicality with visual dynamic. And this demonstrates what the problem is. You wanna maximize your load space in the rear, but look at the size of caboose that gives you. You want that nice sporty line from the side, but then that leaves you with an awful lot of rear and not so much on the top. What they've done here to try and minimize that aesthetically is wrap the sides right round into the back. Again, we have lots of these lines that try and break up that visual aesthetic. Now, previously, one trick that SUV designers used to use was big chrome exhausts. It really drew your eyes down lower. But more and more, what you're starting to see on designs is this emphasis of black enamel finishing. What that does is it certainly gives the car much more aggression. It makes it sit more squarely on the road and it draws attention to the big part at the rear. That old adage, 
If you can't hide it, you may as well make the most of it. And I certainly think you can say that about the Stelvio. Let's take a closer look inside. Well, the first thing that you notice when you open the door is quite how nicely the material matching and the styling has been put together on this car. It's really nice to see the contrast here, but it's subtle and discreet and it's not too in your face. Further down, well, we have more familiar territory of soft touch plastics and then at the base, which obviously is where you want them for ease of cleaning, all of the harder touch plastics that are not so aesthetically appealing. But you know what? You are not looking at that when you open the door. You're looking right here. And this has been very nicely finished indeed. Jonas has now brought us round to the other side of the car so we really can take a closer look at these seats. And what's obvious just from looking is quite how much design has gone on here. Now, they are not the most comfortable seats I've ever sat in at first, but this is important. I'm not the smallest person in the world and I have to tell you that these seats give me absolutely all the space that I need, but they hold me just as tightly as I would like. This car, after all, is supposed to say sports to you. And that's really what you want when you sit down in it, and that's really what you get. There are lots of things about the aesthetic that work really well, but some of those things start coming into contrast the moment that you switch the car on. Well, there are some things that I think could have been changed with the facelift, and one of the most important ones for me is this display right here. As much as I like it a huge amount when we're stationary with the car switched off, the minute that you turn it on, well, the first thing that you gather is that it is not a touch screen. Okay, that's not the end of the world. There are lots of cars still that haven't moved over to touch technology. It's just surprising how much we've adopted to that standard, which means that you do find yourself an awful lot of the time, even knowing that, still stabbing at it pointlessly with a finger. Okay, hardly the biggest thing in the world, we do have a jog shuttle wheel. Now, if I select navigation, that will allow you to see problem number two. I'm not quite sure how well the camera will pick up this granularity, but this is not the highest definition or the cleanest screen in the world that you've ever seen. So that's hardly a deal breaker, but this isn't a cheap car. And therefore I think it should have a reasonable level of equipment fitted in it. So not in love with that, but okay, let's move on. It's just one detail. So if we can't access it by touching it, how do we access it? That would be this jog shuttle wheel down here. And it performs its job perfectly satisfactorily. I guess my only real gripe about this user experience is it just doesn't resonate with the quality in a way that a jog shuttle wheel that you're used to from say a Mercedes Benz feels in the hand. It just doesn't quite present as nicely. Ah, okay, it's a very minor niggle, but with a facelift, it's something that I would have liked to have seen addressed a little bit. And while we're on that subject, Take a look here. This is the gear changer. Well, it really does feel exactly the same way that it looks, which is to say fairly insubstantial, fairly movable, and it's just not pleasing to the hand. And in a car that drives as nicely as this one does, I just would have liked something a little bit more definitive here. But maybe that's just my taste. Back onto the driving experience from the instrument perspective, as you can see, right here. This is the driver's cluster. We've stayed with these big analog dials. I'm personally a big fan of analog, so that doesn't bother me at all. And in the middle, we have a digital display here. This information isn't massively straightforward and it's not hugely easy to navigate. But in fair play to Alpha, they don't have a huge network to pull from in order to get the best of many different systems working together. So, I don't mind that so much. I think every car has its own idiosyncrasies and this one is no different at all. If you're a big fan of the Julia and you're used to the way that this setup works, there's nothing in here to disappoint whatsoever. And let's not forget, it does present very nicely indeed to the eye. So those little quirks about usability, I'm pretty sure you'll get used to the more you use the car. Now, let's move on to the steering wheel. 
Well, you've got a lot of detail happening here and it feels like there's an awful lot going on when you're actually driving. There's a lot to touch. Everything feels solid and nicely put together. We have the volume controls for the stereo on the right. That's a little bit of uh, something different for people who are used to them on the left. Takes no time to get used to that whatsoever. The start stop button is integrated into the steering wheels. Take a look at this. These are the gear changing paddles and they are huge. But what is particularly of note and distinctive about them is that they are independent of the steering wheel, which means that you are really going to notice them. They have to be large in order that they're wherever your hands are when you want to activate them. But that does mean that they take up a fair bit of room for you getting to use these stalks for your indicators and your washer wipers. So you'll get used to that, I'm sure, in no time at all. But if you're unfamiliar with driving the system, it does come as a little bit of a shock. What else do we have here? Well, we've got a large central pocket down in the middle for storing everything. And I have to say, for me, it does speak a little bit to my somewhat issues with some of the other finishing. There's nothing about it that's really that bad. It's just in a car at this price point, I really want everything to feel as solid as it looks. That looks great. But if you're in and out of that every day, I just think it could have been a little bit more solid. One of the things I particularly like about this car is how clean and clear all of the controls have been kept. So we have only one USB presenting itself to us as the driver and still a 12 volt charge point. And a couple of nice discreet cup holders below that. And we even have a very thoughtful looking sideways slot that will take your phone in this way so its charge point is presented easily to you. Now we do have Android Auto and Apple CarPlay on this car, but they are a little bit fiddly to get used to because obviously you can't use a touchscreen to access them. So that's more with the jog shuttle wheel. Drive mode selectors are 10 a penny in cars now, especially SUVs, and a lot of them, frankly, you don't need and you'll never use. The Alpha keeps things nice and simple with the easy to remember DNA. Well, of course, if you want to get a nice clean acronym, there's going to be a compromise made. D for dynamic, nice. N for natural, well, I guess that's standard, so that's nice too. And A for, well, what do you think it is, Jonas? Advanced efficiency. Advanced efficiency, okay, so that's a bit of a stretch, but it does make it nice and easy for us to remember. It's really easy to use when you're driving, and as we can see if Jonas can show you on the screen. What I particularly like about this is the change in color as well. Visually, that's a really nice cue. So blue for standard, red for come on, let's go. And A for, well, at least let's try and save a bit of the planet. You'll get used to selecting those very quickly and simply, and I can promise you they do make a nice difference to the drive of the car. Here, we can quickly and simply select different options on the suspension if we have that available to us. And everything is kept very clean, very clear and uncluttered. Remember that one USB port that we have? Well, don't let that hold you back. We have another two back here and an aux in for the system as well. So nobody's been forgotten. I like this ledge for the phones here and there's still plenty of space for bits and pieces and your change in a nice, conveniently, specially designed holder in the bottom. Well, there's no point buying an SUV unless you can fit actual grown-ups in the back. So how does the Stelvio get on? Nice. I'm five foot 10 or 178 centimeters, but I do have very short legs and a very long torso. So if you have a look at my headroom, you could probably compare that with somebody who's about six foot one. And as you can see, I've got plenty of space and comfort back here. Now, a lot of attention has been paid to the finishing of the materials and again with the aesthetic in the rear. It's really nice and clean. Now, I think it could have been let down or delivered a little bit better in a couple of places. These air vents, for example, are particularly plasticky in their housing. And lower down, great, we've got these two USB ports, but this whole central system just looks a little bit like it could have been finished off a bit more cleanly. But the seats, well, we have the same degree of comfort and support in the back that we have in the front, but there is one very important missing element. And that's that. Now, it really does come down to how you intend to use this car, but I put it to you, there's no point buying one of these unless you want to drive around 
at, let's say, a fair clip in it, at least, you know, responsibly, you're not going to want to do that with backseat passengers. This hasn't been kitted out to pay attention to making sure you're held in place, but it has been kitted out to make sure that you do have a realistic option of a third person back here. You know what, I appreciate that. Not least because in order to make people ever more comfortable in the back of cars, you more and more find that they're really only designed to take two. And it's actually not bad in the middle here. So I've got my legs over the transmission and it's actually pretty comfortable. I could do a reasonable trip back here. And these seats, although very firm, are very supportive and good. I like the plastic backs on these seats. That keeps them very easy to keep clean. It means if you're using this to transport children around, as these very conveniently located latch points would suggest that you might well be doing, that at least they're going to be relatively easy to clean up for. Plenty of leg space. I think for a fair comparison, you should be looking more at Jonas's seat than mine, but you can see I've got more than enough room back here and it's very comfortable and very nicely finished. All right, so you've bought your SUV and you're very happy that you can fit grown-ups in the back of it. You like that it's not too big visually. You're very excited to notice all the additional space you have, but wait. And when I say, but wait, I do mean, but wait. I think that has to be one of the slowest tail lifts in the business. Well, you know, that's not a deal breaker. We can see that when we get back here, we have a very generous space indeed. I really like the way that Alpha have used this space to not only make sure that the backseat passengers have ample room, but you still have a very generous boot back here. We've got a standard 40-20-40 uh, 40, 40 split. Yes, that does make 100%. And as you can see, I can drop these seats down from back here, but they are not automatic. So I still actually have to fold them myself. Now, they're not quite fold flat, but you know what? They're not far off either. So you've got more than enough room back here to fit more or less anything that you could realistically want to. And when you use the car in everyday mode, well, I think you'll agree there's more than enough space and we've even got a little bit underneath for extra storage as well. So everything considered, well done, Alpha. Nice job on the boot. Well, let's take a look and see what's powering this thing. Have to get into the car first. Ah, gas struts. Well, you can see right from the get-go that they really haven't been messing around when they put that away into its house. What you're looking at is the two liter turbo, 280 horsepower petrol all wheel drive. Now there are, again, a bewildering array of engines on offer for this car. You can go everything from a two liter at 200 horsepower right up to a 510 horsepower beast twin turbo. If you want diesels, they go from a 2.2 liter, a 210 horsepower all wheel drive up to, or down to, I should say, sorry, a 160 horsepower, 2.2 liter diesel as well. So I think really the key idea here is whatever you want by way of engine, if it's more gonna be on the end of efficiency or really you want power, you're going to be able to find something to make you happy. This for me is a nice compromise. You have a good appearance of power. Certainly the size and performance is great. I think we're around about 5.7 seconds for the zero to 100 sprint. We're gonna find out in just a little bit. It's not too power hungry though. It sits very nicely within its compartment and I think it should drive quite well too. Let's find out. So what does the two liter turbo 280 horsepower engine feel like in the Stelvio? Well, there's only one way to find out. Let's put it in dynamic and take a look. This has a zero to 100 time of 5.7 seconds. So that's not rocket fast, but it is fast enough. And once you get it out on country roads, what you find is that it corners delightfully for a higher vehicle. Now, we have a little loose baggage, so hopefully not too much noise there. But look at that, minimal roll, 
and it just powers through those corners effortlessly. Now you can have the wheels for this car anywhere from 17 to 20 inches. The car that we're driving has the 20 inch special rims, but I can tell you that you're not suffering in road comfort at all for that. The first thing to really strike you about this car is how pleasing it is to drive. The Julia is well known for being an extremely comfortable dynamic performer. But obviously when you move that up to a larger body, you're not quite sure how much of that performance is realistically going to translate. The answer is, rather pleasingly, an awful lot. That power in this car is delivered to the wheels by an eight-speed automatic gearbox. How does it perform? Well, once I've gotten over my initial slight sadness at the feel of the gear stick, I determined I'd just get round that by not touching it again. The automatic gear selection is smooth, it's precise, and you really don't notice any significant turbo lag. I say significant because obviously it is still there, it is still evident, and you do get it. But you know what? The performance of the power being delivered to the wheels is so enjoyable that you're really not thinking about it. Mostly, you will spend your time driving this car being astonished at how much of the Julia driving experience they've able to keep in the larger body. Now, obviously, there are going to be compromises. Clearly, it's going to have more body roll than its lower brother, and it's not going to feel quite as quick off the mark. But honestly, I just don't think you're going to mind. If an SUV is what you're going for, then you're going to be able to maintain everything you like about the smaller car in the larger one. So, those are the positives. What else? Well, pleased to be able to tell you even more positives. Common bugbear for SUVs, particularly on the smaller end, is that they don't have spectacular all-round visibility. This one makes a very clever use of its windows. So even though from the rear, that tiny letterbox window at the back, you would think would offer you nothing useful at all, is actually really great. Similarly, I'm usually expecting all of my blind spot to be covered by a massive B pillar. And here, I can see plenty back there. It's been very nicely put together. So what am I not completely convinced about? The steering wheel. I have to say, whilst the steering is crisp and responsive, especially when you ooze it into those bends, I really can't think of a better word. It is a little bit of getting used to that you have to do. There are a lot of ridges and bumps on this thing that just strike you as being haptic information that you don't necessarily want or need while you're driving. That's a minor niggle though, you'll get used to that soon enough. The driving position within the car itself is great elevated enough to give you the SUV feel, low enough down into the car to make you feel sporty and still agile. A lot of SUVs you can think of, once you start getting them on those smaller country roads, you're not quite sure where the edges of the car are and they just don't feel completely happy once you start throwing them into the corners. Now, this is not the most powerful engine that you can get. And by the way, it's well worth knowing if you are thinking of getting one of these, they are now all Euro 6 temp compliant, and that's no small thing. They're also delivering you a little bit more power than you used to be able to get out of the predecessor diesel engines. So, if you've been watching this thinking, come on, there's not really that much that's changed, the devil is in the detail. What I can tell you is that the drive is really nice indeed. Whether you're taking it coasting at lower speeds through small villages like this, whether you're able to get onto those lovely faster back roads where you can really enjoy some bends, this car adapts very nicely between one and the other. I've driven plenty of cars where you actually found it necessary to change the driving mode once you came into town because it felt a little bit too racy. I'm happy to say that you don't experience that in the Stelvia. It just maintains its poise right throughout. So at the moment, we're stuck in a slightly slower zone. But even though I'm in a sporty dynamic driving mode, it's still perfectly comfortable. And that's a really nice feeling because it means that I don't At have to concern street, myself. Turn left, then turn right. Thank you. Thank you. Changing the driving mode every two minutes while I'm in the car. And having tried all three of them now, well, we'll see what the fuel efficiency does when we get back to base. But I have turn to tell left. you, Turn right. Thank you, Jonas. 
I'm all about the dynamic. Yeah, I'm sure the economic does something useful and maybe the standard too. And possibly if I'm cruising down the autobahn looking for a way home that I might enjoy it. But you know what? This car's supposed to be driven. So I'm dynamic all the way. Now, while we're sitting here in traffic, waiting to pull out, seems like a good time to tell you about something I'm not the biggest fan of. Now, this isn't the newest feature, and I'm sure anyone who's used to Alpha will have experienced this before. But I really struggle to get on with indicator stalks that don't select a position here. It's a light tap if you want it to only signal that you're going in one way and a longer tap if you want it to stay on, but there is no register position that you can sit it in where it will stay where you left it. And that's just a minor niggle, but again, if you're used to it, it's fine. Yeah, it's a little bugbear for me. I think it's worth pointing out if you haven't experienced it before. Back on the open road again, and you can really comfortably get the dynamicism of the way that that power is delivered to the wheels. There's a lot of clever engineering taking place here, but what I really appreciate about the drive is quite how much you still feel as if it's all your work and effort. A lot of the times, as cars become more developed, more sophisticated, more technological, you're removed step by step. I think one of the things that keeps Alpha so popular in the modern world is quite how much of that driving experience you can still have. So let me give you an example of exactly what I mean. Lovely bit of open road. We're not driving crazy speed. I put my foot down, little turbo lag, and then a nice lift off. Not too much power. I'm not sitting in this thinking, wow, what a rocket. But I get just enough of an engine note to make me think, oh, that's a little exciting. And just enough of a lift off in the car to make me know that I'm driving. Ah, that's a big thumbs up from me. The Stelvio drives very nicely around leafy country roads, but I guess that doesn't come as a massive shock, although it does deliver more than I hoped it would deliver. But how does it handle the Autobahn? Well, let's take it out for a run and see. I think the first thing that's worth pointing out is these seats, whilst being firm, are extremely comfortable. They hold you in all the right places without doing too much. Some sports seats can feel as if they want to have a slightly more intimate relationship with you than maybe you would like. These get the balance just right. Well, now we're coming on to a just approaching rush hour autobahn, which means not so much opportunity for pure speed, but plenty of opportunity for handling. We really get to see how the Stelvio performs once it's in regular, normal traffic. Well, I'm in dynamic mode now, so I have the best that the car can offer me in terms of interest in drive. I've quite a bit of traffic up ahead, so let's switch it into natural and see how that compares. Well, immediately, you can hear the engine note has just dropped off. So instead of feeling I'm ready for anything, it feels a lot more sedate. Pulling out, the power is still undeniably there, so I have everything I need. The car feels balanced, comfortable, and solid. In sum, the total driving experience for this car, I would say the steering is superbly executed. I'm not the world's biggest fan of the steering wheel, but I am certain I would get used to it. The steering itself is superb. It's precise, it's clean, and it's sporty and dynamic. The gearbox, excellent. Does a really nice job of giving you the power when you want it. I could have used a little bit less turbo lag, but when it matters and I put my foot down, I get the power quickly enough. The handling, the chassis, the dynamic control, excellent. Really, really good. The brakes, yeah, I think you could put that down to maybe I just need to adapt to them a little bit more, but they're not as crisp and clean as the drive. So I think they could have had just a little more attention paid. Driving experience, all round visibility, fantastic for an SUV. Comfort, superb, seats are great. Really, I feel like I'm in well, let's be honest, a Julia. That's the driving experience as it presents itself to me. But I'm higher up, I feel more secure on the road, and I'm ready to have an awful lot of fun while I'm doing it. So, I would have to say, 
If you haven't tried one of these and you're a little nervy about it because you're a big fan of the Julia, you're not sure if you're still going to be happy when you make the switch, give it a try. I think you will be very pleasantly surprised. Well, it wouldn't be quite right if we left here today without giving you at least a small peek at the Quadrifoglio. And of course, that completes the lineup for the Stelvio. The Stelvio, the business, the BTEC, the Super, the Luso, the TI, and at the top, the Quadrifoglio. Goodness. When you put that together with all of the engines and all of the trim interiors on offer, my goodness, if there is something specific about the way that you would like your car to be, you will now be able to find it with Alpha. But all of that is a little bit by the by. There were always a good range of options. I think there's just been a lot of sharpening happen in terms of the offer and what you can have that suits your style. But what do we think about the car itself? Well, it represented a good value price point drive for what it was in 2017. There is a lot more competition within this sector now. In terms of the drive itself, you're still getting an awful lot of alpha for your money. It isn't cheap. Pricing's going to start somewhere around about 45. And if you start looking at the big beast here, well, you are heading north of 100,000. Ouch. But don't forget, this is the top end and there is an awful lot in between. So you should be able to find something that fits not only your style, but also your wallet. I still think it's a fantastic amount of drive for the money within its sector. As far as the styling inside is concerned, well, you're either going to be an alpha person or you're not. So if you haven't had the chance to sit behind one of these things and the only thing that's putting you off is whether or not you can get the alpha drive experience in an SUV format, please give it a go. It's astonishing how much they've managed to carry over. Obviously, this sector is only going to be improving in both substance and quality. So in terms of what the other manufacturers are going to be doing over the next 12 months to compete with this, well, I think there's an awful lot. And Alpha are taking a little bit of a gamble by not pushing too many changes with this refresh, but they are answering what their customers have asked them for. So, Given the way that this has been received so far, I think there are only good things to come in future. That about does it from us. If you have any comments or questions, please pop them below. Please subscribe, and we hope we'll see you again soon.